DEF CON 30. Who's having a good time? Yeah. Whoa, you guys, awesome, awesome. That's great. So, this talk is by Rex and Junior. So, let's give a big DEF CON 30 welcome. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for coming to our talk about bypassing system call tracing. Uh, my name is Rex Guo, and this is my co speaker, Jin Yuan Zhong. So uh, we have a lot to cover in this talk. So I will just jump over this slide. You can look up us online. Okay, so imagine a sophisticated attacker compromise your Linux production environment. He launches a lock for shell exploit and then fire reverse shell back to his machine. Then he discovered that the machine is running a vulnerable version of pseudo, so he elevated privilege on the box. And then he read the Etsy uh, shadow file to see if there's any interesting hashes or crack. He also discovered that he can do SSH hijacking to move into the second machine by reading into the process environment variable. So he moved to the second machine. And as he is celebrating, he discovered that his access was gone. So he fired the RC again, uh, there's no luck. Quickly he discovered his access was completely blocked. Now let's take a look at the other side of the story. Uh, while everything is happening, your security engineer receives a sequence of alert uh, from the cutting edge security monitoring software. And this software is able to monitor the system calls and also process information for the application. So for example, when the attacker executes a reverse shell, there will be a connect system call, and maybe others, depending on the reverse shell technique. When the attacker read the SC shadow file, there will be an open or open as system call. Essentially, any non-trivial action that the application perform will need to involve a system call. So how do you use uh, the system call information to detect threats? So here we show a really, really simple example. Uh, let me explain what this is. Mm, here's a rule that try to detect untrusted program reading the SC shadow file. And let me explain the rule. It's saying if the system call is open or open at, and has a read permission, and the file name points to at C shadow file, and the program is now in the allow list of programs, that will fire an, an alert. Now you can probably see that um, you can build a much more complex rules and even machine learning models on top of this data set with you know, one system call, even multiple system calls. But they all rely on the fact that the system call monitoring software is able to extract the data correctly. So in this talk, uh, we were going to dive very deep into these uh, system call tracing technologies. And then we'll talk about the vulnerabilities that we discover that allow, uh, allow us to bypass the tracing. Um, and then we'll conclude with mitigations and takeaways. With that, I will hand over to Jun Yuan. Thank you, Rex. So, um, as Rex mentioned, system tracing is very important to detect any threats. So, this diagram can give you an overview of system tracing. Basically, the system tracing includes in two parts. One is the hooks for system interception and also the tracing programs. So, when the application issues system call into the kernel, the system call code pass is executed. If there any hooks placed inside the code pass, the attached tracing program will be triggered to collect system call data and send those information to the uh, tracing monitor agent to detect threats. So the tracing program can be implemented in, uh, in the kernel space as shown on the left diagram or implemented as a user space program as part of the monitor agent which is shown on the right side. So the program used to collect seasonal data like uh, statistical arguments is called tracing program. This program can be attached to different hooks like trace point, k pro, key trace. So we can uh, directly leverage the Linux native mechanisms as tracing program or implement your own tracing programs as kernel module, eBPL pros, or user space programs. So the first kind of hooks for statistical interception is called trace point. Basically, it's the kernel uh, static hook. Uh, for statistical interception, the Linux kernel provides this enter and this x trace point. So if we attach the tracing program to the trace point, the function call of traces enter and traces exit will use the same parameters to trigger the tracing program. Uh, 
The first parameter is called Rex, that's saving the uh, statistical arguments, and the second is called ID, which saves the statistical number. Trace point provides low overhead, but it only provides static statistical interception. You can also use the dynamic approach like KPRO to intercept system call. So using KPRO, you can register the tracing program on almost any instructions in the kernel code pass. Like basically it's a Cisco code pass. So when the instruction gets executed, the tracing program will be called. Compared to trace point, the KPRO is the dynamic approach, but you need to know exactly uh, how data is placed on the stack or register in order to get the useful information. So ptrace provides a user space solution for Cisco interception. Similar to the trace point is a static hook in the Cisco enter and exit. Using ptrace, you don't need to implement any uh, kernel programs as a tracing program, but only uh, user space program needed. Compared to the previous two approach, uh, ptrace performance overhead is high. But for optimization, you can combine with the seccom as a Cisco filtering for better performance. There are other approach for statistical interception like LD preload. This approach actually is easy to bypass if you use assembly code to trigger the system call. So many of you have probably heard about the cloud workload protection products. This product usually provides advanced threat detection based on Cisco tracing. There are different kinds of the, uh, cloud workloads such as uh, virtual machine uh, containers on customer managed VMs service containers and others. So for service containers, it's usually allocated and maintained by the cloud providers on demand. So it usually no, have no access to the host. This table summarizes how different Cisco tracing techniques can be applied for different cloud workloads. For virtual machine, we can use any kinds of hooks and tracing programs. Tools we can leverage including Fargo eBPF, kernel module, and Fargo PDIC. We'll talk about these tools later in our talk. For containers that are on customer managed VM, we can have the same options as uh, virtual machines as long as we get enough capabilities. For service containers, um, as we mentioned, it has no access to the host. So we can only uh, use ptrace as hooking points and implement tracing program in user space. Instead of the Fargo kernel module and eBPF programs, we can only use the Fargo PDIC. Fargo used a similar techniques to trace system call. It's an open source project in CNCF. Uh, it's very popular and in kernel space, it supports kernel module and eBPF Pro using trace point. In user space, PDIC is developed based on ptrace. So P, uh, Fargo P uh, PDIC uh, is dedicated for seasonal tracing of service workloads. So we did not evaluate other security monitor agents, but we believe the popularity of Fargo represents an implementation that is widely accepted by the community. Unfortunately, this kind of implementation uh, for seasonal tracing is vulnerable to a total issue. That is time for check, time for use. Let's take the connect system call for example. The second argument for connect system call is called user V address. That is a user pointer pointing to the user space buffer called socket address. So during time of check, the tracing program will reference this user space pointer to get the socket address. And during time of use, the kernel will also reference the same user space pointer to also get the socket address. But between time of check and time for use, the user memory pointed by the uh, user V address is vulnerable to be changed by the attacker from the user space. So in this case, the socket address can be different between time of check and time of use, causing a total issue. So let's uh, dive into the connect system call, which can help you understand this total issue. So when the application issues a connect system call into the kernel, the system call handler will check if any tracing programs uh, attached to the static hook at system call enter, like ptrace, setcon, sysend, trace point. If this is true, the tracing program will be called. And after that, the handler will look up the Cisco table and jump to connect system call to create a connection on the socket. 
Before returning to the user space, the handler will again check if any tracing program attached to, attach to the static hook at syscall exit, like ptrace sys exit trace point. Similarly, if this is true, the tracing program will be called. So as, as we mentioned earlier, the second argument for connect and call is a user pointer pointing to the user space uh, or socket address in the user space. This pointer is propagated into the connect system or code pass and assigned to different kernel variables, which is highlighted in red. The kernel calls move address to kernel function to make a copy of socket address from user space to the kernel buffer called address that is highlighted in green. After that, the kernel will call the internal function, six connect fire function, to create a uh, connection on the socket based on the kernel buffer address. And this is the time of use by the Linux kernel for connect system call arguments. So before the memory copy function, the kernel buffer is not created. So the user pointer is the only place we can dereference and also get the socket edges from the user space. In this case, during time of check, if we attach the tracing program to the static hook at system call enter, or to any places before the memory copy function using dynamic approach like Kpro, the tracing programs have no other options but need to dereference the user pointer to get the socket address. After the memory copy function, the kernel buffer is created with copies of the socket address from user space. However, in this case, um, this total issue may still exist. So think about we, if we attach the tracing program to the static hook at system call exit, like this exit trace point or ptrace, the tracing program may still will dereference the user pointer to get the socket address. Falco PDIC used ptrace for syscall enter and exit, but it only used the syscall syscall filtering as syscall enter since the syscall is not available for syscall exit. For Falco version older than 0 0.31.1, the kernel module and eBPF implementation only used the um, six exit trace point. So hopefully you get some idea about the total issue for syscall tracing. Next, I will hand over to Rex uh, talk about the vulnerability. Okay, so the uh, example that we see is on kernel version 5.7 and on connect system call. But really the observation is, uh, <coughs> is true across all the kernel versions. Um, because we confirm with the kernel developers, these um, talk to windows exist since the day that trace point and ptrace are introduced because they, they were originally designed for uh, performance and debugging purposes. So um, in order to do secure tracing, what they recommend is, you know, the software need to monitor the kernel memory uh, instead. So report this issue to Falco. Um, basically the issue is they use the sysexit trace point and they also use the sysexit p trees. Um, and there's a, you know, a version older than 0 0.31.1 uh, is impacted and if you happen to use the commercial version, you may want to check what version is impa impacted. Um, so we reported this issue in December and the uh, issue is mitigated in March. The, the mitigation that was deployed is um, for uh, the Linux security module or the eBPF version. They check the sysenter and sysexit um, system call argument for selective set of system calls. And they also do the same for Falco PDIC. In terms of uh, how many system calls are Im impacted, so we analyzed the uh, open source rules in the Falco repo, and the uh, majority of them are impacted uh, with uh, two exceptions. One is the exact V system call. Uh, the reason for that is in their implementation, when they trace the exact V, they actually read the kernel memory instead. Uh, the other one is the send to and send message system call. Uh, we haven't found a reliable way to really block the system call. We'll talk about what blocking means uh, uh, in the next few slides. Uh, but keep in mind that it's very heavy to monitor send to and send message, and this typically limits its usage. Okay, so uh, hopefully everybody understands the vulnerability at this point. Uh, it's fairly, relatively simple. 
but let's talk about how to exploit it. Now, in this, um, to exploit this, this, this uh, tree scene, we don't want to acquire any additional privilege or capabilities, right? Basically, attackers should be able to evade the detection at any user, any privilege or capabilities. Uh, we want to have some level of control on the time to inject the delay, and we'll talk more about what, what I mean by that later. Uh, we also need to inject enough delay such that when we override the uh, memory, the, uh, the machine has enough time to propagate the overwritten data to the whole uh, machine. The last thing is we want this exploit to be 100% reliable. Um, because if the attacker being detected once, then its uh, entire operation may be at risk. So this leads us to two exploit, uh, exploitation strategies. We'll just quickly brief overview the uh, exploit strategy the num number one, which is what we did in DEF CON last year. And from there, you will see how we reach exploit strategy number two. So last year, we discovered that you can actually inject a relatively small amount of delay by using cross-core interrupt. And because the amount of delay we inject is relatively small, we have to precisely orchestrate the whole process. Uh, what, what I mean by that is have to inject at the precise time, precisely override it, and also synchronize using some special techniques. Uh, one of the primitive that we use in the whole exploit is user for FD system call. Uh, now, although this technique is uh, powerful, it has some limitations. So for example, if you use Docker uh, container and you enable the Docker default second profile, uh, Docker will actually block the system call. Um, a, a, the other thing is the, the most cloud workload don't use the system call. So the usage of this, this system call itself indicates some kind of anomaly. And this is actually the mitigation deployed by Falco last year. They implemented a detection rule to detect the usage of the system call. Right, so last year we went back, we think, um, you know, can we actually uh, develop something that doesn't rely on using the system call? So we come, come up with the scenario. <clears throat> um, what if you can actually inject a delay that is really, really long? Um, then you don't have to orchestrate everything in the precise timing, right? It sounds very simple, but the question is how to do this. And we actually find out there are two ways to do this. One is to uh, use the blocking condition in system call. Uh, this can be used to attack this exit. The other one is to insert additional setcom rules. This can be used to attack this enter. So what do we mean by uh, blocking the system call? If you think about the underlying mechanism of system call, it's basically the kernel interacting with resources on behalf of the user space program. Now a lot of, a lot of these resources are IO devices and the kernel will need to wait, wait for the response from the device uh, before you need to proceed. Okay. So let's look at a concrete example. Uh, this is the connect system call. And in this diagram, there are two machines. There's a client, there's a server. Now, let's say the client is monitored by tracing software. The client wants to talk to the server, so issue a connect system call. When the kernel starts executing, it will notify the underlying networking stack, and then it will send a SIM packet, server return a SIM act, and then client return an act. Then the system call will return. Trace point ptrace will read the arguments, uh, before the system uh, call exit, right? Now you may be wondering, this is computer networking 101, uh, what can go wrong here? Now let's imagine this scenario. Um, many times when the attacker compromise a machine uh, or the workload, they would try to talk to the command and control server. This is a very practical setting. So in this case, the attacker con also controls the server side. So let's look at the example in detail. Now, uh, in the diagram, there's a client and a server. On the client, it's monitored by the tracing software. And then the attacker creates a system call thread. The system call thread is first going to create an override thread. And then the system call thread called the connect system call with a memory page that points to the malicious IP it wants to talk to. Then the kernel will send the same packet over to the server. Uh, 
Now remember the attacker control the server, so the attacker can say, hey, I want to drop the same packet. Then what happened? The client will resend another SIM packet. And then the server can drop the packet again. Then the client will try again. So every time the client retry, there's a delay controlled by the TCP congestion algorithm. Uh, without going into too much detail, roughly you can think about it as an exponential delay for every retry. While this retry is happening, the override thread is going to override that memory page with the benign IP address. And then we have enough time for that data to propagate to all the memory copies on the system. And then finally, servers say, okay, here's, the, here's your SIMS uh, app packet. And then you'll, the uh, trace point and ptrace will read out the benign IP address. Um, and then the system call will exit. So um, to show this works, we will show you two demos. Uh, first, we'll show a demo on uh, a VM container level. So in this, in this uh, demo, there will be a, first you're looking at the server side. Now notice the server IP address ending with uh, 176. Okay, and then we fire up this XDP program, this XDP program looking for a specific SIM packet on a specific port. And then we also fire up a listening server on the server side. And then on the client side, we run the Falco software. We also uh, run the Wireshark program. Then we run the exploit. It's basically a TCP client that tries to connect to the server. You see the connection is successfully established. Uh, and then it's sending some chat message. Now you see the server re received the chat message, it's sending something back. Right? Everything's working, connection is there. But now if you look at the uh, IP address reported by uh, Falco, it's actually saying 1.1.1.1. Uh, but if you look at the Wireshark, it's saying the first SIM pack, two SIM packets are dropped, and the IP address that is communicating is actually the server, the real server IP address. So this indicates a successful bypass. Okay, now in the second demo, we're going to show you the bypass on Fargate. Um, so similar here, first we're showing the server side. The server IP ending was uh, 163. And we're going to run the XDP program that's going to drop the SIM packet. And then we're going to start the listening server. So here's the Fargate uh, container. Um, it's going to run the PDIC with our attack program. So notice that PDIC report that the connect system call is actually connecting to 1.1.1, which again indicates uh, it's not able to identify the real IP address. Right? You see the client server connected, they start chatting. But PDIC report, hey, we're connecting to 1.1.1. Okay, so at this point you're probably wondering, um, you know, this is for connect system call, what about the other system calls? Uh, so we find out that the entire class of file system system calls are impacted. Um, also, if other system calls that relies on file system to perform some task, are, they're also impacted. So one example is the exact V and exact V at system call. Because when you execute a binary, first it's going to the disk to fetch the binary. Uh, next, Jun Yuan will talk about how we bypass the uh, file system system calls. So uh, before I talk about how to bypass the open access system call tracing, so let me introduce FUSE. So FUSE stands for user space file system framework. It usually includes in a kernel module, uh, user service library, and also a mount utility. So in cloud scenario, uh, FUSE is used as the remote storage FUSE so with such fields, we can uh, mount the remote objects as local file system and also access the remote file as local file. Since it's a user space file system, so it provides faster involvement or development. Uh, 
and it usually do not panic the kernel. So uh, remote storage fields is widely used. So here is the list of example. From this example, you can see the major cloud provider has their own fields. So this is the general architecture for remote storage fields. If the user space application or container wants to open the remote file, uh, use the fields. Basically, what it does is the same as opening a local file. Uh, it will issue an open or open access and call into the kernel, and the request will be route, routed from the uh, VFS layer to the fields kernel driver and then to the uh, user space file system daemon like uh, GCF, GCS fields. The daemon will send the request to the remote storage uh, like uh, GC storage or AWS S3. Once the response is back, it will send back to the uh, user space application through the original pass. So one thing I need to mention here is the delay between the client and remote server is much longer than the syscall is uh, in the client. So basically, you can leverage the long delay to bypass the open access tracing. So let's see how it works. So we have the malicious client that is monitored by the tracing program. The syscall thread is going to open a remote file called malicious file. Basically, it will issue an open access and call into the kernel with the pass name pointing to the malicious file in user space. Since the file is stored remotely, so the open at request will be routed from the kernel space to the user space and then reach to the remote server. Before the response is back, the override thread can jump in and override the pass name. Uh, pointed uh, override in memory pointed by pass name from malicious file name to benign file name. And again, because the delay is much longer than the syscall itself, so the CPU have enough time to propagate a change to different copies of memory and registers. So what, uh, after the response is back and before returning to the user space, the tracing program can use the six exit trace point to, to get the arguments from the system call. Unfortunately, this argument has been changed from malicious file name to benign file name. In this case, we can successfully bypass the open and system call tracing. Let me show you how it works in a demo. So we have a console on the left so for the uh, Google Cloud Storage bucket. And we deploy the Fargo agent in GKE cluster. And we log into one of the pod. We check the process inside the container. So we have a Fargo agent running. We have a GCS fuse daemon running, which mount the Google Cloud Storage bucket uh, into the local folder, MNT. And then we check the logs for the Fargo. So there are one event generated because you just log into the pod. And then we check the folder and then T, so it's empty, which means uh, Google Storage Bucket is empty. And then we're trying to uh, open the file, open a file called malicious file in NNT folder. Yeah, then ch we check the folder. So the malicious file is created in the remote storage in Google Cloud. We check the FACO logs again. So there one event generated. Because we're using an uh, open app system call to open the malicious file and the NNT folder. We remove the malicious file. which will be removed from the uh, remote server. So you run the attack, as you just mentioned. And you check the empty folder. So the malicious file is created by the attack code. And then we check the lock for the FACO. So there are no new event generated, which means our bypass succeed. Next, I hand over to Rex to talk more about the exploits and also conclude. 
Okay, so um, you know the previous few example on networking and file system. Uh, basically, these are examples to demonstrate that how you can trigger the blocking condition in system call. Now, you know this doesn't exhaust all the blocking condition. There are many other ways um, that you can trigger blocking condition on different system calls, but uh, we're going to talk about um, how do you set comp to uh, bypass this call tracing as this enter. Um, so if you recall the, the slide um, earlier, when the system called executes, it first going to hit ptrace, and then going to hit seccom, and then a bunch of other stuff, then the real system call is going to use uh, the reference to user space memory, right? Now the question is, can we use seccom to bypass the ptrace tracing as a center? Before uh, I dive into the exploit, uh, just a brief recap about what SecComp is. So SecComp is a, a kernel mechanism to filter system calls. You can build, you know, more than sandbox on top of it, and it allows the developer to filter system calls and even based on their arguments. Now, if you have complex SecComp rules, this quickly become harder to compute and takes more time to compute. Um, also. One caveat uh, to keep in mind, which will be uh, useful later, is the first inserted second rule will get evaluated the last. So uh, it's evaluated in the reverse order. Okay, so here's uh, how to bypass the, the uh, P-trees um, uh, sysenter. The idea is very simple. Now what you're seeing here is uh, just a single machine. The attacker runs the system call thread. First it's going to insert a bunch of second rules and then it creates the override thread. And then it's going to call a system call, right? So in this diagram we use create at, but really this works for any system call. So in the create system call, it passes in the path, na path name that points to malicious file, uh, sorry, benign file. And uh, p is happily read the benign file argument. Then the second check starts. And then the override thread at the same time is overriding uh, the uh, memory with the malicious file. Because the seccom take uh, quite a bit of time to compute due to the number of rules that we inserted, then uh, the system has enough time to propagate this benign file to all the memory copies. And then finally, seccom compute finish, kernel reads the argument, and kernel actually create a malicious file for us. Okay, so um, there's one uh, interesting caveat uh, related to ptrace is you can use ptrace in plain mode. You can also ptrace in the mode called ptrace plus seccom redirect. Uh, what that means is um, when the tracer, if, if the tracer start the application, then the tracer can say any system call that the application calls, please redirect back to the tracer. So tracer is going to insert a seccom rule first. And that rule says, as long as you hit the second rule, you redirect execution back to the tracer. So if the tracer is able to insert the first second rule, then no matter how many second rule that the application inserts, it's not going to impact the timing window between when the tracer reads the uh, system call argument and when the kernel reads it, right? So in this case, it's not vulnerable to the attack. But if you are attaching to a running application, then you have no control on how many seccom rule has been inserted before the trees are attached. Okay, so uh, we have covered a lot of different uh, uh, issues and also how to exploit them. So just to summarize these issues and also how to mitigate um, different scenarios. So uh, first thing is p trees as a center. Now in order to mitigate this, uh, you can use ptrace plus seccom redirect, but you need to start the application as well. Now, if you need to attach to a running application, you may want to inspect what seccom filter has already been inserted uh, to see if there's any anomaly. Otherwise, you can also insert a seccom redirect, but then that means all the previous seccom rule inserted by the application are ignored, uh, so it won't be used for it. Um, the second thing is trace point at the center. Although the talk to issue exists, but we haven't found out a reliable way to exploit it. The next one is trace point at the exit. 
Now this is a vulnerable to both the attack in this talk and also our uh, research last year. In order to mitigate this, one option is to compare the sysenter and sysexit trace point data to see if the uh, argument has been tempered. Of course, this will incur some performance overhead. Um, and the other option is to use KPRO, uh, which I will soon talk about in the last uh, row. So uh, next one is Ptrace as sysexit. Now it's vulnerable to the same attack uh, as the previous one. In order to mitigate this, one will need to deploy all the mitigations at uh, Ptrace as sysenter and then compare the uh, Ptrace sysenter and sysexit uh, results. Last thing is kprobe on uh, other kernel internal functions. Whether this is vulnerable really depends on which uh, kernel function is being probed. Um, but in general, if you, you want to avoid the uh, Tocto issues, specifically on system call monitoring, uh, you can pick the Linux security module interface. Um, some newer kernels also allow you to do BPF RSM. But um, this depends on how wide range of kernel you need to support because the Linux security module interface has different support across different ver uh, kernel versions. And if the you know, specific uh, kernel interface you happen to inspect is not in RSM, then you quickly get into the complexity of figuring out whether that exists in all the kernel versions you want to support. Okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, first, if we zoom into this uh, research issue, right, the first thing is we show that the kernel uh, tracing can be bypassed reliably in many different ways. So if you happen to use a tool that does similar things, uh, you may want to check if your tool is vulnerable to this. Because we've only evaluated the open source solution, um, we didn't evaluate any proprietary software. The, the second thing to keep in mind is the mitigation is complicated, depends on what you know, form factors that, that you use and also what kernel versions that the, the software need to support. So you want to double check that the mitigation was actually uh, implemented in the, in the way that you want it to be, right? Um, and then if I zoom out from this particular issue um, a little bit, if we think about the bigger picture, uh, if your security team is able to uh, correlate different data sources and have a comprehensive view about your environment, then it suddenly makes the evasion uh, complexity much higher. Last but not least, this is something that we do a lot at Lacework, um, is that we uh, understand, you, know, we, you, you should understand that your environment, uh, what is normal, what is intended to be wrong in your environment. If you know the baseline of your environment, then even if the attacker is able to override these uh, arguments, they're, they're basically being constrained to the value that is, um, that is uh, fit into the normal uh, expectation. Right? Okay, before uh, we take the q and I just want to give a quick shout out to the following folks. Um, so Joe helped with the kernel and security discussion. A lot of my uh, Lace Work Labs colleagues give uh, great feedback on this work. Also, I want to thank the Fal Falco open source team for a very collaborative um, you know, disclosure process. And also John Dixon for uh, helping the presentation. Um, so before uh, finally take the Q&A, if you have other, any other question about cloud security in your environment, or if you want to advance your career in cloud security, I'm very happy to talk to, to you guys offline. Uh, with that, uh, we're ready for Q&A. So anyone who wants to ask a question, there's a mic here, and uh, Steve will help uh, to, to walk to you guys. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, in some of your screen captures, uh, you had kind of your exploits from last year. They were uh, Phantom V1. These are Phantom V3. What was Phantom V2? Uh, 
Oh yeah, thank you, thank you for that. So um, <clears throat> certainly there's too many attacks that we publish. Uh, <laughs> so Phantom V2 at the time we called it semantic confusion. Um, so it's also for the folks who, who's not familiar with that, that's also a bypass on the system call tracing. Um, the idea is this, um, when you trace file system object, uh, for example the at shadow, uh, if it is an open at, then the rule is basically detecting whether the path is open at. But what if you create a link that is linking to the file object and then you open the link, then the tracing software will not be able to interpret it but the kernel will be able to interpret it. So there's a confusion between the tracing software and the kernel. Yeah. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Yeah.